Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number two. This is really fun. We've been talking about doing this for so long that to actually sit here in our office slash bedroom in our 849 and a half square foot house is pretty incredible. That was, by the way, built in the 1920s by my great, great grandpa, but I'm like a great, great step kid to, to that grandpa. So I like to claim great, great grandpa because he was cool and he was a pioneer, but ultimately I'm still just, uh, whatever I, we step doesn't matter. Okay. I'm getting big eyes. If you saw Amy's face right now, which you can't, she has big eyes looking at me and that means shut up, Neil and move on. Welcome everybody. <laughs> we're so Hi, guys. glad that you're with us. Hey, we also have Eric, which we were trying to decide, well, how do we, how do we introduce Eric? He's like our IT, uh, super cool producer, engineer, extraordinaire, who is really good with things like what we're doing right now. And we are so glad to have him with us. Yes, He's we are. also got a mic in front of his face, just in case he wants to say anything. Eric, Hello, everyone. <laughs> Man of many words. <laughs> Precise words. Precise. Though. That Which, actually is one of the beautiful things about Eric is he was, what What was your profession, first job right out of college? Uh, I was a technical writer. Yeah. I, I uh, went to college for computer science, but the company that hired me out of uh, college uh, had me do technical writing for about six months before I started doing coding. That sounds honestly like very precise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hey, this this season is called Wayfinder, and Amy and I have, uh, over the last 20 years of our lives, we have attempted to find our way, meaning just be on the path that we believe uh, that we are created to walk out, and it's been lots of highs and lows and bumps and bruises and all kinds of things, but we've also spent those uh, these last 20 years trying to help as many people as we possibly can do the same. So in some ways, we've kind of coined the idea that uh, we are wayfinding thought leaders. It's so weird to say something like that. It's not like a self-driven title that we're trying to use, but uh, truly it is like the goal of our lives is to try to help people find their way. Hence, we wrote a book called Wayfinder. And uh, if you want to pre-order a copy of that, you can do that over at our website. Just because you're pre-ordering, we're going to going to give you a 25% discount to get that thing kind of kickstarted for us. We're very excited about that. That's at neilandamy.com. There are also links connected to that uh, that are right here surrounding wherever it is that you are listening to this podcast. So uh, today, the setup, this is what we're trying to, we realized we shot episode one last week, but we didn't give you uh, the listener a lot of context as to who are Neil and Amy and why in the heck would we want to listen to to these guys. And uh, that's what we're trying to do today is just to share a little bit of our story. So we're just calling this session story time. And um, yeah, Amy's like super chatty today. I don't know what she's talking so much about. It's like, what's up? Oh my gosh. I, how, what am I going to interrupt you? Yeah, I can't even that, get a if, word in. Yeah. If like, if it was like normal like, everyday pause? life, yes. Interrupting. Oh my gosh. Here we go. You really like starting out on the right path. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the right way for us. Yeah, and you really have my number dialed on trying to get me angry. Mm -hmm. Then I clean the house. Mm -hmm. That works. You Gosh. guys know this actually works. Like, I just want to, this is a women, plug your ears, men, all two of you that actually care about what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you're having a hard time with your wife actually cleaning the house. You need to, you need to kind of ramp her up every once in a while, get her ticked off enough. And then next thing you know, it's like, whoa, like freaking Tasmanian <laughs> devil just went through this place and this spit shine. You're like, dang, like that is the way to do it. I, on, honestly. And then there's the makeup thing too, which is cool. Anyway, back over oh to you, Amy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I would not recommend it whatsoever <laughs> at all. I have a feeling by the end of this episode, I will be shredded by her. You will, but it'll come at a perfect time. Oh, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, story time. <laughs> story time. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I've been talking this whole time. Should I just continue? Or how about, uh, do you want me to start? You want to start? I can start, even okay. though I told you to start first. But yeah. now that it's actually rolling, you're doing that. Okay. <laughs> 
Posh, you make me so mad. <laughs> you really sorry, do. I'm like, not, it's like not so even funny. funny. It's funny to me. It's not fun to me. Can we pause or cut? Or is that no, not a thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot. Because I really want to sock you right now. Go for it. Honestly. Oh. This isn't on video. Give me a good one. It's okay. Okay. So. I'll start. Thank you. What about, so, do you like stories, honestly? like, If I have to listen to, like, the same story over and over and over again, no. Right. So, like, I like to, like, tell the story or listen to a story, but I don't want to hear it on, like, auto-dial repeat. (laughs) (laughs) What? Because... You're about to because I I'm know. about to share some That's stories. I'm like, pick the good ones, Neil. Pick the good ones. <laughs> Don't waste my time or anyone else's. <laughs> well, and you might have to help me out, like kind of jog my memory here a little bit. But um, one of the things about Amy that I absolutely love, and golly, we've been married 20 years, and she is what I would say either the like the queen of metaphors. She loves using metaphors. One of my favorites is like, and she'll just it's pop off. It's not that I love using the metaphor. It's like, that's the only way I can actually communicate what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, when you say, Amy, what are you thinking? How are you feeling? I can't actually put into words, but I mean, I could tell you, it feels like I just jumped off a diving board and landed in an empty pool with a cactus. See what you I'm know? talking about? Like, I think you can understand how I feel by that. Yeah. But if I were to actually like start telling you about my emotions and everything else, it, it would muddy the water. Yeah. That's really good. The only part that hurts my feelings is when you talk about our marriage like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should find some new tactics to get the house clean and oh. a couple other things that might help. Yeah. Just saying. But, but metaphors are cool and storytelling in general is just cool. Like it's kind of a way to connect. So I honestly kind of envision this almost being a little bit more like, hey, campfire kumbaya-ish. Like, hey, we're just kind of sharing a little bit to um, give okay. context. Well, now that we've wait- wasted a minute of the listener's time, mm-hmm. we'll just dive right in. Yes, go. So I'm Amy with an IE, the oldest of five, uh, grew up. In a very small town, my parents uh, dated since they were like 13 and 15, and they've been married, what, 40 years now? Yeah. Uh, So I grew up in a home that wasn't, there there wasn't divorce in that Mm -hmm. home. Very lucky for that because it seems like that's kind of just a normal thing these days. So I I learned a lot about how to work through relational issues just by happenstance. So lucky me, <laughs> lucky you, um, five kids in my family, uh, Amy, Ashley, Jake, Jesse, and Abby. The age difference is I'm 38 and Abby is 22. Correct. No, no, just turned 23. 23. She just turned, had a birthday, 23. So I was 15 when she was born and What'd you tell your Gosh, mom? Gosh, I was yeah. so bad to my mom and dad. I mm-hmm. actually, I do feel a little bit bad at how ornery I was, but. That's an apology for you, mom and dad, just so you know. But man, I just remember they, we were all sitting around the table and they're like, my mom had had some health issues and so she was going to the doctor and stuff like that. But um, then she says, I, well, actually I take that back. She was on the phone with your aunt, Tracy. Okay. That it was like I think all in the next, like in about a twenty-four hour period. She finds out she's pregnant. She calls your aunt, aunt because another unique, interesting, fun fact about Neil and I is, I grew up with his aunt and uncle calling them aunt and uncle. Like, like I genu- as a kid, I really thought they were my aunt and uncle. Um, that would be Tracy and James, which yes. would be my dad's little brother little and sister brother. that are yeah. twins. Yes. And Jennifer. So yeah, yeah, that Amy was very, very close with my family. Honestly, I would say closer to my family than I actually was. Like Mm -hmm. she, she, her family spent all kinds of time with like my grandma and all those different people. And we kind of knew of each other, but, or whatever, but we didn't like really know each other. Yeah. Well, she, 
is on the phone talking to your Aunt Tracy, and she's crying, and we're like, okay, what's going on? So she says, I'm, I'm going to have a baby. Well, I just lost it right there. I was like, obviously, you guys don't even know how to do math, <laughs> for one, mom and dad, <laughs> because I'm 15, and that means I'm going to be raising the daughter <laughs> because you are so old. I mean, we just celebrated your 30th birthday, like Which means five years back. Die. And I ser- Ashley and I were in the car, like crying, like, are, oh. what do we have to go buy a plot at the cemetery next? Like, what's going on? <laughs> this is horrible. And now you say you're going to have a baby. So what? I'm going to have to push you around in a wheelchair while you're nursing the baby. Like, I was bad. <laughs> I was so bad. And honestly, I've made peace with the fact that I wouldn't be surprised if, like, I'm 50 and, like, and some miraculous some I have a baby gift. just as, like... Here you go, Biatch. You wanted to be a little <laughs> Biatch to your parents. Now you get to actually get pushed around in a wheelchair nursing a baby. Like, I've actually made peace with that. Honestly, like, I'm like, actually that would like, be an answer to my prayers. Like, I've been praying pushing that. Pushing me around in a wheelchair <laughs> no, nursing? No, that, that baby at that age of our lives would be oh. like, whoa, what a... Just kidding. Okay, well, anyways, you would have to hire a nanny just for me yeah. and then a nanny just for the baby. Yeah. I'm just giving you a fair warning. Yeah, that's probably going to happen anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> Back on track, back on track. Uh, So there's that 15 years difference. And I think that growing up being the oldest of five by default, if you actually haven't ever looked into the birth order, that is a fun thing to do. So I don't even know who wrote the book, but you should Google birth order. Like I think it's called birth order syndromes or like something like that, because it actually is pretty dang accurate. Yeah. I mean, you have the oldest, they're like bossy, take charge, you know, you are going, I'm going to hold you accountable to what's yes. going on, that kind of Which mentality. is quite like Bradley Caden and Quincy, like ours. It's like, yeah. there's a very clear birth order here. Yes. Very clear. And Bradley Faith is our oldest, the one that we um, talked about. She was born two weeks after we got married. I realized listening back to our podcast, we didn't mention her name because we were telling a story and then we introduced the other two. So Which, by the way, that's my hear, middle name, Bradley. Yes. When you hear Bradley Faith, it's our daughter, not our son. Mm-hmm. And she just turned 19. It was either Bradley or Charlie. And we felt like Bradley was a little. Yes. Well, and it's after you. So that was kind of a fun little twist to do a Bradley with an IE. And then Kate and James, James after your brother, Cody, Cody James and Kate and James. And then Quincy. Um, Asha. With Quincy Asha with an IE on that too. So, yes. Not that you guys all needed to know the spelling and all the birth order, but whatever. Birth order is fun fact. So, I am your typical type A, you know, bully. bossy. Okay, you can call me a bully, whatever, but I'm getting stuff done. So, commander. Bully's not really <laughs> the yeah, right word. Commander is definite. Personality traits, if you take uh, the 17. That'd be Myers Briggs My, or yeah. also like 17 personalities. I think it's called 17 personalities. That's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I've taken it like six times. I've tried to fake out the system multiple times and I still come back commander. Commander, <laughs> which is E N T J, right? E N T J. E standing for extrovert and intuitive T thinker J judger. But it's not the judger that you think it is like judgmental. It's like you make your decisions based off of, factual intel that you've gathered not off of an emotion or yeah. it's yeah, not casualties like the t- are just casualties because this, like when you just plot it all out it's like this is the lesser of two evils let's go yeah, you just that's how i make my decisions like okay let's look at this fact this fact okay here we go entj um, yeah and then you being the same that's a very interesting dynamic yeah so she's just kind of bouncing over to my personality type, I am the uh, same mom, same dad, oldest of two, but then there's like some divergence there. I have two younger brothers from my mom's side who are kind of like little clones of my brother, Cody and I, and then my dad also um, had two children before uh, me. So my, so they're halves, even though we're not really considering anybody halves or steps like family's family to us. However, I do have two older siblings and two younger, sub, sub, three younger sli- siblings, and oh. one from the same mom how and dad. Much it gets could, a little twi- how much more twisted than that. Chuck. If a woodchuck could chuck. Well, honestly, I can't wait to talk about all that part. So Okay. Yeah. I also am an ENTJ. And the stats that we have seen on these personality types are interesting. 
I, we've seen stats that say ENTJs are pretty rare. Like within women, it's like 2%. Within men, it's like 5%, something like that. So basically we both have like rare personality types and they're both known as commanders. But then for us to connect, that yeah. just is kind of like mind boggling. Kidding. I mean, it's been an interesting journey though to like figure that out because we didn't even start doing the... Um, I want to disclaim this. I, I am only teasing Amy right now, just getting under her skin just because she needs it. And w like far from miserable. It has been so fun, so interesting. But I, we know no other couples necessarily that are the same personality type. And we've worked with any. lots and lots and lots of couples. Typically, it's like the exact opposite personalities right. are the ones that are kind of, it's the opposites attract thing for whatever reason, you know, God pulled us together and it's really clear, like our story kind of points in that way. But yeah, we're both ENTJ. So we've had to learn to like default in some like, or to defer is the right word, leadership to one another in different spheres. Yes. And I think everyone around us, our team, that's kind of an odd thing. Like, I don't think that's usually what happens on teams to have such strong personalities, but then be married at the same time. So that's kind of fun to watch your team navigate through, you know, they have to watch a lot of like rough conversation where we're challenging each other on decision making or yeah. things like that. Cause well, and I don't think this is all true, but some of the ENTJ traits that are pretty incredible that are, you know, like the weapon of choice for an ENTJ is a grenade launcher or a missile launcher. Like basically like if we see a circumstance that needs to be done, like let's end it. And we also have this thing that is kind of like more of a hunter gatherer mentality, which is um, you eat what you kill. Therefore, if you have like people that are just like freeloading off of the system or trying to ride the back or take the credit or do those kinds of things, like that's when the grenade launcher comes out. Right. Because we want people to get credit for where credit is due. Um, yeah. So. And it's, it's more of like a, a teamwork mentality. Like Absolutely. That super frustrating to not have people who are like that have that essence about them that the teamwork they want to you know whatever i think it it could get misunderstood the whole like what you kill you eat it kind of sounds one a little rough but the idea behind that is that we do not want to create freeloaders entitlement and so we'll show you here like this is how we're going to hunt this is how we're going to do this stuff and we are willing to give everything yeah. away but at the same time we want to make sure that people understand the importance of teamwork and pulling your own weight on a team because yeah. it really does jack up the team bad when people start yeah taking the back seat and want and telling everybody they're in the front seat yeah for sure and and so back to amy's family she has well one her parents are just like collectors of people they always have a little posse that runs with them and so she grew up like that amy um, I don't know where you're going in your storytelling, but I was thinking about how, like, if Amy cooks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to cook for small groups. -uh. When we got married, I was like, do you want spaghetti? He's like, yeah, I love spaghetti. And I made, like, enough for, like, 24 people. And you it were was like, the two of us. What are we going to do with all this spaghetti? I'm like, I don't know. We don't even That's know That's just how I know are. how to make spaghetti. <laughs> He's like, what if you just cut the recipe down? I'm like. I could do that, but I don't like, I'm just telling you, I'm an autopilot. I'm making spaghetti. This is how we make it. <laughs> well, what about the time with our friends, Scott and Nicole, we were going to this concert for the weekend and, and I did the camping. math on that. Yeah. I, a quarter pound of Turkey per person. <laughs> if you had two sandwiches a day, which I thought we were going to be doing, but we didn't, we needed, I think it, I think we had 17 pounds of Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Scott, this guy is our friend. He's super conservative, very thrifty. Like, hey, we've got like this much money and we're going to spend this on food and all that stuff. And like Amy comes out and she's got like a shopping basket just for the turkey. Well, the funny part is, is like I was genuinely concerned we were going to run out. I'm like, yeah. we have to, we are not going camping and running out of lunch meat. Like yeah. that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Yeah, because among like a family where there's five kids or there's lots of yeah, people Yeah, and around. there's always people stopping in. Yeah, it's like, oh no. So like you, you don't want to run out of food. Plus they lived, Amy's family lived like up on a mountain, like 15 minutes or so away from like a store because uh, her dad, who was a, like a city fireman 
on his during his off time, he wanted to relocate his family to a place where um, where you know it was like more in the trees and not just like the kids being raised in the city. That was a value of his, and so he started building his own house. He did it all completely like 100% himself, but with like the help of friends. So that's why there was always people mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. and years and years went by. And we're talking an incredible house, like a 65 foot, like lookout tower in this house, like it, 35 a 35 foot. foot climbing wall in the living room. It's pretty cool. Yes. Looks like the bottom of a boat kind of mm-hmm. it's pretty cool, but he built it and envisioned it, envisioned it all himself, which is hugely where Amy gets her creativity from her dad. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. My mom, I get my people skills from my mom, you know, my mom's so good at customer service and that's my number one trait. She's great at that. We put her at the host stand at the restaurant all the time. Just keeps them coming back. No, my mom really is good at customer service, but I think I took after my dad and that it's like one try. Okay. I'm going to be nice. Two tries. Okay. I'm going to be nice. Okay. Now you've drawn, I'm drawing the line and that's it. You're not being a nice person. Move on. (laughs) it's great for business front of the house manager (laughs) um so going to our stories though like things that have shaped us Mm -hmm. i think that well that's kind of interesting and fun to tell because i grew up with my mom and dad with the family of like the idea of family like was a big a big deal. Like my mom and dad sacrificed a lot of time and money to make a a family. Like life is always pulling families apart. But my mom and dad were, they spent a lot, they put a lot of effort into trying to keep fam, our family and other, other families like connected together. So that is a high value of mine as well. My dad's dad was a retired master sergeant in the United States Marines. So things were very black and white growing up, like, and which I love because that's just who I am, black and white, there's no gray. Um, But I think it's funny because in our relationship, if somebody's wanting a lot of compassion, everyone knows not to come to me. Not because I'm not willing to give it, but it's just, I, I don't know, I could come off a little aggressive in it, but I feel like, whatever shaped me when I was young in like the stories, like I didn't grow up listening to like lullaby stories at my grandma's house and my grandpa's house. I was like, tell me war stories. And he would actually tell us war stories that were very, um, very brutally honest. I mean, to the extent where he died right before my Papa Cliff died right before saving private Ryan came out. And I was, he died Two weeks before my little sister, Abby, was born. So June 2nd, was it? He died June 1st. Abby was born June 19th. And I, Eric, do you know when Saving Private Ryan got released? Not offhand. I can look it up for you, though. Okay. Because I feel like it was right around the end of summer of the year that he died. Well, and I I think it was when I was in high school, like 97, 98, something like that. 96, 97. I don't know the years. I'm not really good at the years. But my point is, is that he, you would think, oh yeah, he was like, um, let me hop in here real quick. Yep. It was uh, July 24th, 1998. July 20. Yeah. So the next month and a half after her. Yeah. Wow. You got a good memory. My memory is still working. (laughs) Anyways, um, it came out and I remember, well, first of all, before the movie started, my dad had my papa's gun, one that it wasn't the same gun he used in, um, he was in World War II, uh, Korean, War. Korean, Vietnam, and another war that like nobody really talks about. But um, he had, my papa had got a gun that was like a replica of what he used in World War II. And so before the movie started, my dad got the gun out and he was like, okay, and it was me and my siblings and then obviously like a bunch of other people that um, would just come over and hang out. And so he got the gun. He like passed it around and he had all of us take um, the shell like a bullet and then put, load it. And just so we could see how long it took to put another bullet in because these were not like semi-automatic guns. 
So he's like, okay, so hold the, hold the bullets in your, put the bullets in your pocket, put them wherever you have. Cause right now you, not only are you hungry, tired, um, mentally exhausted from what you're having to deal with, but now you have to like kill other people that in, you know, in nature, most people are not born just wanting to kill people. Like that's not a normal thing. So now you're having, you're under so much stress, but now you're having to do this because if you don't kill, they're going to kill you and they're going to kill your friends that are on your team right here. So he's like, okay, so we each took, took a turn of, you know, trying like me, he like created a stressful environment for us. And then to try to see like how long this is going to take and, you know, the bullets falling out and you're having to scramble to find it and put it and all of a sudden it like all these stories that he was telling that my papa was telling me growing up and I'm going to get emotional just thinking about it. He didn't, let's just say church up the stories because as I sat there and watched saving Ryan, I'm only 15, but tears are just falling down my face because the reality that this is not a game. This is not a video game. One, this is not what media is trying to make war look like. This is the real deal. And a lot of people lost their husbands and their sons during this time. But it shaped who he was because he was a 17-year-old boy who enlisted in the Marines and his mom signed him over because his stepdad beat him. And the best thing for him to do was to get out of that town and have a purpose. And the Marines offered that to him and he took his chance and, and it was the right chance. It was the right path for him. But when you meet people in a, a, a regular given day, you don't think about the things that have shaped them. Everybody's quick to judge. Everyone say he's a jerk. She's, you know, um, overconfident, this person has no self-esteem, da, da, da. But very rarely do people look at people in the eyes and go, what shaped you and why are you the way you are? And I think if we did that more in society, it would be such a more peaceful and graceful experience because the things that shaped me growing up are not like the regular, I don't, I don't have any other friends that had that same type of shaping whether it's their parents got divorced when they were young or, you know, their grandfather didn't was so wounded from the war. He know he didn't even want to talk about stories that he didn't even just ignore ignore that altogether. But I had a healthy experience of my papa telling me that and why I'm sharing that with you is because it would be easy to listen to our podcasts and it would be easy for you to judge me, the listener to judge me and say, gosh, she's so cutthroat or she's just so matter of fact. And I don't like she has no compassion. She has no whatever. But the shaping that m- created who Amy is, it's not happenstance. Like, it's not, what's the word? It, it didn't, didn't happen by chance. Yeah. yeah. Well, it did happen. Well, I don't know if that's the right word it, either. But, but it, there, there were actual things that happened. Yeah. And I think that being able to kind of tell that now, because I haven't ever really talked about that, it's made a lot of sense for me to give myself grace because... I'm the way I am because a lot of things that have shaped me. And when we dig into things like why I said I didn't want to marry a pastor or things of, um, you know, I'm not going to let my kid slam their door and lock themselves in the room. When I actually have like stories to back up why I am so headstrong on these things, I think that when you, the listener, you'll, you'll be able to give yourself grace for actually digging in and looking at your life and going, oh, that's why. When so-and-so says that, I respond like this without even thinking, oh, that's why. And I hope that you do that because life is a journey and there's good and bad things constantly happening to us. But if we can actually look at why we're doing what we're doing and kind of navigate through that, I feel like um, you'll have more peace. And what this whole podcast is about, the white, the Wayfinder about living with true joy, not just happiness, but true joy through circumstances, you're going to be on a journey with us of giving yourself more grace. And then what happens is once you are able to give yourself more grace, you're always able to give your brother or your sister. Or your spouse. Well, no, I just mean like brother, you know, brother or sister. I got where you're going. More grace too. 
Um, hey, to- yeah, that, that was number one. Like, yeah, I always love it when you talk about your grandpa. I, I have pictures. Well, I've seen literal pictures of you at like 10 or 11 years old sitting <laughs> without your shirt on up in the tree above your grandpa's yeah, I didn't house. like well, wearing clothes. I still don't. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And she was just like in the, in the tree and their, their place was right on the river, like a beautiful river. And uh, she would just sit up there and like yell, "Hey, Papa!" You know, and it's like I don't. She had got this. I don't twink know probably, how I got this twink. Well, he was from, from him. Yeah, he was from Arkansas, and then Nanny yeah. grew up in New Orleans. Yeah, she was so, born and raised. And you loved being over at your Papa. Oh gosh, Cliff I loved and it. And Nanny Marie's. Like I pretty much rolled the roost until yeah. my little brother Jake was born, and yeah, then he, he, he took over and ruined yeah, everything. It was like sewing day. Nanny, will you make me ninja pants? Sure. <laughs> this is Jake's milk. It's a special chocolate milk I made him. And you girls, it was me and Ashley at the time, you girls can't drink it because Nanny loved Jake. But yeah, she just loved boys. She did. Yeah. She did love boys. But Papa always had, but, uh, like, Papa always had Ashley nice. Always. Always. Well, back. Tell, tell a little Papa, uh, like, cigarette smoking story or something. Like, give a little context. He's a funny dude, too. Yeah, he, he was a great storyteller. Actually, if you, I just was talking to um, Tony Click, which is a guy who yeah, went to school with, with my dad. But even last night, I said something about Papa and he said, gosh, I miss him. He was such a good storyteller. You could, he, you could sit with him for hours and not get bored. Mm-hmm. He, your Uncle James used to say that too. Yeah, but you got like, he, he used to like, let you act like you were smoking cigarettes. Oh, we didn't play house. We played, um, we, li- we played little Marine camp growing <laughs> up. So he actually let my nanny take his uniform and cut it down to fit us kids. Like legit. Wow. So we would take turns. I didn't know she, that. yeah, she made it small, but then she could un like she, as we grew, it. she could unseam it kind of and make it a little bigger. So we would all fight over who's going to go first, but um, I usually won because I was pretty the good at it. And you're the yeah. ENTJ. Yeah. So um, we had to do it exactly the right. We had to hold the um, rifle a certain way and we had to walk in and then we had to knock on the door and Papa would be sitting in the living room with the gorgeous Kern River in the back in the corner of the room. So it was like very pronounced, like he's the king of the mm-hmm. castle right here. And he had his uh, recliner and then we would knock on the kitchen table and then we'd walk over and we had to walk a certain way and we just loved it. It was so fun. We'd knock on the door and I'd say, private Navy Danielle Lyons report to speak to the drill instructor, sir. And then he would, he would say permission granted or permission denied. And you never knew which way he was going to go. Yeah. But the funniest part about it is that if you were a random, like a fly on the wall, you'd be like, what are they doing? Because he actually did exactly what they did to him or like what he did to people in the military. So he'd ask you like, where are you from? And I would say, uh, Alta Sierra, California. And he would cuss and he would say whatever he, GD, I hate people from out to Sierra, California. No one good comes from out to Sierra, California. And like, he'd go off just like regular. And we, we'd have to be quick and we'd have to come back with responses. And, um, I remember my nanny walked in one day and she's like, they called each other mama and daddy. Mama. Yeah. And he, daddy, daddy, you need to stop with that. And he, and we were, I remember Ashley and Jake were like, big eyed, like looking like we're, we're next. They're standing behind me. And I'm like, no, 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 we want to do this. We want to do this. <laughs> it looked like the most dysfunctional, probably family exercise, but we had a good time. That's cool. Super cool. Yeah, that's good. Hmm. Those stories, honestly, like that, that could be case in point. The whole episode could be over right now. Um, so much more of those types of Mm-hmm. conversations to come. I, I've, um, both Amy and I had, uh, grand grandpas that served, but in different capacities. And that's definitely a huge part of our, our stories, the impact. And I would say pivotal to both of us is the impact of our families, specifically our grandparents, obviously our parents, but our grandparents impact on our lives. And I, I would say the most pivotal impact on Amy's life would be her Papa Cliff in many ways. It makes me want to cry too. Fidgeting with my hands. <clears throat> so, I think that the re- the way you can say that is because so much of how my 
Papa raised my dad, it like came down. My Papa was so big on like respect and value of humanity and things like that. So it's not like we're discounting our parents. We're actually like, um, it's actually, it's actually validating and like a endearing thing because they weren't the parents that were like talking trash about their parents and trying to do it different. And you know, they're idiots and no, no, no. They actually valued that. And then they, Gave, gave us, even to, you yourself, yeah, that, that platform and that relationship to learn from that because you only have them for so long. And I think a lot of families miss out on that. Yeah. Where I was going with that is is for me, like I had a, a grandpa that served, several that served in the military, but, um, but my grandpa Larry was certainly uh, that influencer, not just in my life, but in the lives of many, many, many people. And um, it's a key point in our story and like who we are and why we do what we do and the way we do it. Um, I do feel like it's important to touch on in your family, in your story, just kind of maybe one final little thought around just that your parents were, I would certainly say if like there's classifications of like liberal Christian, meaning like more open Christianity or um, conservative Christian family, like they seem to kind of embody those conservative Christian values. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that when we get into kind of like where, because it's interesting, Neil and I actually pastor the church that our parents went to when they were young. And that's going to be a fun podcast to talk about because there are some really great things about that. And there's some very challenging and negative things that are that come from that as well. But they were conservative based off of the people who were pouring into their life because neither one of them were raised in church. Their parents didn't take them to church. But then when they started going to church, they had mentors that kind of shaped them into a certain way. And I think that you just, you want to make your mentor proud. And so they kind of, that's going to be a fun story to unpack of how that happened, how all of that really values were established. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in, you know, when our story then merges, uh, you know, a little bit down the line, um, 18 and 20, you know, we're married and we'll jump over to that here shortly. But, um, you were like, not, you were at the point of like, Hey, I'm kind of veering a little bit more away from the organized institutional mm-hmm. version of the church, if you would. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I, I was kind of veering toward, and that's where we, our stories intersected right around that time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, anything else that stands out to you or anything you want to touch on? Um, no, are you going to start talking about your, your story? Or if I don't you just bore try you, to like avoid that? If I don't bore you to death. Yeah, totally. Well, here, just, you know what? Just, you could just step away for like 10 minutes and. All right. I'm going to go just, be a Max and Easton and buy some stuff at tjmax.com. I'm not getting paid to, <laughs> to go there, but you should, you can get great curtains. Great. Curtains. 54 inches by 96 inches for twenty four ninety nine for two panels. This was super unintentional. But Velvet <laughs> ivory. This is exactly what you needed to talk about. Like, come on, let's think about who Amy is and like what makes Amy tick and thrive. Like from the time you were young, you were the one who was organizing, like designing. My mom taught me how to do all that. Yeah. I mean, she totally did. But but there came a point where like, no, Amy, like what color are we painting this wall? How are we doing? Mm -hmm. How are we arranging everything? And everybody started looking to you for that. And your dad was a photographer who started Mm -hmm. his freestyle photographic company Mm -hmm. in college. Right. Yep. And then did that for many years. So you were like a film carrier. I had a little, my cute little, he bought me a little turquoise ice chest to carry around his, um, medium format film. We only got 10 shots. Yeah. And so don't screw up in a wedding when you only have 10 shots to take of, and you have to time it out because here comes the bride. They're up there doing the vows. You got to time out all of your clicks. You don't want to use too much. And then you have to make sure you have enough time to put another roll in so you can get them kissing and coming back up in the aisle all in 10 photos. Yeah. And then you, if you in like focus left your camera or left the film out, like you'd ruin it. And yeah. There's a lot of like critical things. There's like, yeah, the heat and. Yep. And the, and the kids always make fun of you because your dad, used, he made you make a cardboard box no, camera No, he didn't or make us. We just, it, when I was in kindergarten, um, I had a project to do and I didn't know what to do. And he was like, well, let's make a camera out of a Quaker oatmeal. Oat, yeah. yeah, Quaker oatmeal. 
box and we did and we I actually took a picture of Nanny and Papa sitting in front of my garage and I have that somewhere. With that. Yeah. It but worked. What makes Amy tick truly is design, creativity, uh, you know, just I- anything to do with that. If she's in her zone, finding her call, making life count, living life full of joy. Um, she's doing the Max and Easta work and she's, mm-hmm. you know, redesigning everything. So I mean, right now it'd be a good time to tell you that I need you to take all of the seats out of the sprinter van because yes. tomorrow we have to pick up Facebook marketplace stuff oh, an hour that's, away. From that's here. always my favorite day of the week. <laughs> good. It went over well. I was kidding. <laughs> Bring us back on point, Eric. Well, I was just thinking about how how good you are at graphic design and interior design. Oh, that was uh, something that just really surprised me mm-hmm. working for you. And Interesting. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the kind of remodel at Ewing's, um, I could just see the skepticism in a lot of people's uh-huh. face, including me. <laughs> you know? Gosh, and that was freaky. Now that it's done, I don't think I've heard one person say even a single thing negative about it. So, and we're talking like a 70 year old restaurant that was straight, like all wood, like woodsy animals on the walls. And she like went in and like whitewashed stuff. I was freaking out. You were freaking out. Yeah. Good point, Eric. Thank you, Eric. So, Neil. Yeah, Neil. Who is this guy? Neil, tell us about your many personalities. Mm. Well, which personality would you like to speak right now? I want to hear about the little boy. The little boy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, oh, golly, why you got to talk like that? As a little boy, I would say I like to run around with my shirt off. I like to. You were a toe head. So I was you had a that toe head. blonde hair. I liked working with my dad in the yard or my grandpa in the yard. I loved packing a shovel around and like digging in the dirt. Um, loved the animals. Uh, but not too much because I had allergies like crazy. <laughs> Which I do sneeze. too. So that's, an, was that's another win. We yeah. both are allergic to animals. Yeah, therefore we have none. Which is not that cool. But um, yeah, so and what's really interesting is right where we are right now, we're at, we're at a house that's on James Road. James Road is my family's house. Uh, hence Co- uh, Cody James, Caden James, you know, the, the James family, James Markets, you know, that was the... That was the, you know, we're in the house that Billy James built, you know, when he was like near 70 years old, which would have been the great, great grandpa that we're talking about. I'm on James Road right now. And I used to, I was just saying this morning to a buddy, like I used to walk down this road right here. And it was like, I was four or five years old walking to school. And so I think as a little boy, I had a heart that I did not choose, just like all of us. Let me choose the innate tendencies within us. Amy didn't choose to be bossy. She just is. Mm-hmm. Um, I, she, and I'm kidding. Like, I'm perfectly comfortable being called bossy. I do, it is. does not make me mad at all. Bring it on. Bring it. As a little boy, I don't, there was like a, uh, I could only describe it as I, I genuinely wanted to please God as a little boy. I, I loved, I loved God. Now I remember some twists in my life where that veered pretty hard at a pretty young age in kindergarten. But you know, ultimately <laughs> when I dropped the first shit on the playground, it was like, uh Oh, and then <laughs> like, thank you, John V for teaching me shit. <laughs> I remember walking up to my house and we were playing guns and I walk around and I like act like I shot a bear and I yelled, Oh shit, a bear. And then my dad was right behind me and he, whoop my butt and you know but there was this desire inside of me to like do good and to help and to love people and I remember like singing and just like enjoying like I used to um you know at the at the church that we are now pastoring right I used to run up on the stage with my little guitar and you know jam out I just there was a certain sense as a little boy that um I don't know that's kind of that's the little boy thing but honestly and I I don't say this to I always want to be very careful. I, I, nothing that I'm saying is a negative reflection on my parents. But at about the age of seven-ish, um, we were sitting on the porch swing just right up the road from here. And and what I thought was a completely perfect world, um, it, that moment it seemed to just come totally toppling down. And my 
brother and I were sitting, Cody and I were sitting on the swing and then my mom and dad through tears came out and said, we're going to be divorced. And I remember thinking, I, what is, what, what, I don't even get it. Did not know, but it just felt big and everything changed. Um, truly changed. Like, like, you know, we weren't involved with the church like we used to be. We weren't, um, you know, we didn't do the things that we used to do. And, and in some sense, like an overarching sadness kind of like entered into life, I guess. And I, I watched that sadness in my mom. I watched that sadness in my dad. I felt like the dysfunction of like being with separate parties, you know, like this set of grandparents and, you know, you just pick up on like those details and those things have a way of truly corrupting you and making you view life in a different way. And so I remember as a little boy, there was like a, almost like a shattering, if you would, of, of a perfect world, even though the world was never truly perfect. It just, as a kid, I think my parents did a great job of making it feel that way. And then all of a sudden one day it was not that way. And, and then all of life was just different. And, you know, you know, mom moves up, you know, to this place in Walker pass by my grandpa Larry. And that was like a temporary thing, but she was just now at that point, just trying to find her way. And my dad was like fully committed to the business that he has grown in amazing ways. You know, he's the, uh, not the founder of the business, but in many ways he implemented the, the founder principles that have taken the business over and over and over again to new levels. But, um, that wasn't without sacrifice and you could talk to him and you could go, man, he wouldn't, you know, he, he's been through a number of marriages. There was a certain time of his life where that was difficult. And my mom as well, like went through a number of marriages. And, and so there was, there was like this, in, this overall sense of like, of life is good and, and God, like he loves us and it's good, but there's, there's this brokenness. And it wasn't that my parents were not, they, they're 100% like, I believe just God fearing, God loving people. And I try to use the term spirit a little bit more than God, because I think that, you know, it kind of evokes a different sort of a feeling, but they certainly built those principles into me. Um, they embody those principles in many, many ways. Um, but if I looked at like my family story, I would have to say that overall, you know, my faith and family story, there's, there was the broken family aspect of that, that shaped a great deal uh, of, of who I am and what I've gone through. Um, a lot of my, uh, don't care that shows up at different times where it's just like, you know what? It's kind of, or I can call it the efforts, you know, like I just don't care. Like I F it. This is just how I'm going to, I'm going to check out like this, or I'm going to do that or, you know, piss me off long enough and F it and F you and I'm out or I don't need you. Um, you know, there was like a guarding, I think of my own heart that was set up because it seems like, well, everybody in some way is just going to hurt you anyway. So if you just don't let anybody in, you know, it's like, just here, put a good thick wall up and then you can just kind of be back here kind of hidden. And I think that that's kind of what happened as a little boy. You know, again, I was loved. I had great parents and grandparents and people around me, great life. And I'm not complaining at all, but I think if I really look at the depth of my story, that was something. So, um, I don't know. Is that, yeah. And it, is that a boring story? No, it's not boring at all. Thank you. Back to being shaped by things. I mean, ultimately, <clears throat> we believe that, like, the creator works all things out. You know, even tragic things. Somehow, you know, when your heart is in the right place, he works it together for good. And... Hopefully the listener's not listening and going, oh, great story, horrible story, tragic story, feel good story when they're listening to our stories because... My dang story. It's your story. Because in my family, everything was not perfect. No, I'm not mm. acting like it is. But the things that shaped me, they really were good. Yes. And the things that shaped you really were good because... For whatever reason, the the hardship and the pain that you had to walk through at a young age truly has helped you in the later like in absolutely now. Like you're a, a very hearted snake. Just kidding. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it really has shaped you, and you're able to help other people. And 
relate in ways that I, I cannot relate. Yeah. You know, so there was this, yes, yes. There's this like turning point that happened in my life and tell us about it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Nice little segue. I, I think every one of us, we're like chasing things to fill the void and it doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't like for me, there's family brokenness is like a missing piece. that's no longer, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I might've like used like sports and like diving all into like sports season, you know, those like fanatics fanatics are like in many ways, it's like, it's like they idolize this thing and this thing just becomes the biggest thing, the best thing. And it's like the, it's the thing that's going to save the world. It's the latest, greatest thing. And it's like, ah, here, you know, so for me, I had a lot of those things, um, at different seasons of my life. It was like dirt bikes. Like I'm all into dirt bikes. Yeah. Like dirt bikes. And then basketball. Oh, it's my favorite sport. Hands down basketball. And then it's like, no, no football. Now it's football season. You know, I'm into this. I'm into that. Um, it could have been like popularity or any of those things, but you're just like, you're aspiring to do or to be and and all of that. And I, I found myself at a, at an age of like 18 ish where I really was kind of, I, I, that void was just growing increasingly large and the need for a satisfaction or fulfillment was none of the things that I was using to satisfy myself was, was they weren't working anymore. It didn't matter um, if it was like partying, you know, at one point it was just like hanging out and smoking pot and doing things like that with my buddies that actually filled a certain void. Um, maybe it was, uh, you know, shooting hoops on the basketball court and beating people's ass. Like that was the thing. Like I absolutely loved winning and, and that like, I just got my fulfillment and I could go to sleep at night and be like, yeah, I did that. You know, there was always something trying to kind of take the place of this emptiness that I had inside. And finally at the age of 18, I started to like own that really own that. And so this is like a turning point piece. The book wayfinder actually has a little bit of this written into it. Uh, I won't over communicate this hopefully because Amy's heard this a zillion times, but you will too, if you keep listening to us, because this is a thing that we talk about. Um, for me, I had that void. I was playing ball. I had kind of arrived at what I thought was going to be like satisfying. And I got to be on this team in college and things were going good, but I still at some level, gut level had this emptiness. And I'd always called myself a believer. Like uh, mm-hmm. I'm a believer. You mean like I believe there's a God. Like I believe, that? Yeah. Like I believe there's a God. And if somebody said, Hey, what religion are you? I would have said I- I'm a Christian because as a kid, that's, you know, what I was taught and what I learned. And I resonated with that. Um, but I, but I don't necessarily think I like embodied the values of that. Like I was a nice person, a good person, if you would, but what is a good person really? Like, um, so I, I just, I started to kind of come to terms and wrestle with some of that. And I remember walking over to my coach and just said, Hey, you know, I forget the guy's name. Honestly, I've been trying to remember it, but I walked over to this coach and said, I've been playing this game like six hours a day for this last, like several months. And I don't know why, but I'm still completely miserable. And I've called myself a Christian for a really long time, but I don't even know what the hell that means. So I think I'm going to grab a Bible and I'm going to go to the beach. And he looked at me dumbfounded. I don't, I still wish I could know what that guy was thinking. His jaw kind of dropped and he just said, uh, Neil, you have two days to get your shit together and you can still have a place on this team. But that was nice to give him. He gave you two days. That was very nice. Like over the top. Nice. And so I left and I, I did what I said I was going to do. I went to like this Avila shell beach area and sat on this rock overlooking the ocean. And I cracked this Bible that I'd packed around for a long time, but never really opened it. I cracked it open. Thank God I landed in the middle, which it has like some stories that I could actually resonate with. And I was just reading and reading and reading and some made sense and some didn't. And then I left and I went back to my own ways and then um, went back the next day and did it again and read and read and read. And it was like, there was some sense of like, wow, this is like scratching an itch that I, I, it was very inquisitive to me. And I just wanted to kind of hear more. And, um, so the pivotal turning moment is I go over to my buddy James's house that night where we used to party a lot. And this, you know, lots of people, lots of drinking, lots of pot, lots of things going on. And, and, uh, this gal walks in who I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And she looks me right in the eyes th- from across the room, walks straight through the room. This is the part where Amy, again, she's probably heard this a thousand times. Um, walks straight across the room, doesn't break eye contact with me, walks up and she says, you're not happy. 
And I was like looking at her like, am I in a trance right now? I don't know what's up. And she said, it's time for you to wake up. And she reached up and she grabbed my cheeks with both hands and she shook my head. And instantly, from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes, I felt like I was changed. I felt like I was transformed. I felt like, man, like if I rated all the emotions in my life at that time, pre this head shake moment, anger, rage, malice, envy, jealousy, you know, all these different, like what I would say negative emotions were just like swirling in me. And at any time somebody could piss me off and I'd say F you or whatever, like it was just kind of the way it was. But at that moment, now all of a sudden a flood of these new emotions, not totally new, but new in the sense that they came in so hard, so strong that they felt completely new. And it was like for the very first time I felt love, joy, peace, you know, these things that I now know to be like the fruits of the spirit, like just flooded my life. And I remember looking at her and just saying, man, that man, I just said, thank you. And I walked out and I got in the truck. And I drove away and I went back the next day and I said, Hey, I had this other dialogue with her, but that was a turning point in my life that I would say I, I went from being miserable mm -hmm. to being awake, to being full of life, to being satisfied, to being satisfied by the simplest of things. It could have been just like a glass of water simple, uh, looking at a tree. And I remember like seriously looking at trees and mountains going, wow, that was created. And it just was very impactful to me. And it shifted the trajectory of my life. And at that point, that's when I would say I found or the way found me. And it was through some seeking and some searching and some mining it out but I didn't have to look very hard, very long. And what I discovered is that the creator wanted to reveal to me that there was a whole other way of life out there that I hadn't known yet. And it was literally just right there. And I, I was able to embrace that and then move forward in, in a brand new light, if you would. And uh, it's like your second chance. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So it was a key turning point in my life. And, um, Anyway, I think some other things I would like to share just generally about myself, because um, I just love talking about myself. I would love this, uh, the, the family story, back to, back to my grandfather, Larry Zabel. Um, take some time, if you can, look up Larry Zabel. He, he passed away about 10 years ago, and um, Z-A-B-E-L is the spelling. Um, but what will happen if you search him is... Uh, cool picture of this super hips old dude will pop up. He was an artist and he painted, like, look at some of the paintings that he painted. Um, he was very creative and um, very, very gifted. And, you know, in he didn't his start out as a painter though. I mean, he always had like the painting gifts because his mom had taught him at a young age, like art and the value of art. Yeah. But he actually started out being a photographer for the military. Explain that. Cause that's a really interesting story. Yeah. In fact, I'd love to, I think I should, we should throw a link up, Eric. Maybe you can make oh, a yeah. note of this. Um, it's called, it was called a point in time. It was in the 1960s. And this was this video of my grandpa and he was like the, the voiceover guy. Um, and it's like his work and on the military, in the military and some of his actual footage and paintings. And it got released shortly after he had passed away. Somebody found it and it was really cool. Um, I'll be sure to put that in the show notes. Awesome. Perfect. So uh, grandpa was a combat artist this is where that, you know, he, he, he did serve time in the military, but he got out and then his gifts and talents kind of brought him back in, but as a civilian. So he's the civilian combat artist that would fly in the jets and the helicopters in these crazy places. And he would drop in with guys like Cliff Lyons and, and he would be in those spaces where he's like, he's capturing the footage in the swamps of Vietnam, you know, and um, he's in that, he's in those spaces and he was a man's man. As far as I'm concerned, like my grandpa was an absolute stud. Um, he, you know, <laughs> gosh, I remember one time my brother Cody, cause my grandpa had like donkeys and pigeons and Guinea hens buffalo. and buffalo. Yeah. Buffalo. <laughs> he, he had cool stuff at, he didn't have the buffalo at the same time as the story, but, um, 
Cody's like walking out in the barn and he steps on this nail. And I remember, you know, like he steps on it and then went all the way through his shoe, through his foot. And my grandpa like rips his shoe off and just begins to like suck the blood out of his foot. And I'm like, whoa, like this guy is a mutt. Like what is going on right here? And he spit the blood out and he looked at me and he's like tetanus. He's a little boy and that's a rusty nail. And I made sure that that didn't get anywhere in there. And it was like, oh, okay. You know, he was, he had like his whole house, that particular house was all ran off of a generator and he had these kerosene lamps and stuff. Cool pond, huge bullfrogs, like awesome, like really, really fun. But there were certain spaces and everybody knew like Larry Zabel, Larryized, I guess, Zabelized um, everything he did. He had hot barbed wire that attached at one point on this generator open as an open power source that powered his house when he fired. It was like he did some really like shoddy stuff at different times. He duct taped his shoes. He'd pull the mold off of the bread and just like chuck it off to the side and then toast it. Um, you know, he, the best cantaloupe I've ever eaten in my life came like we were sitting on the back of his old, uh, maybe like seventies two wheel drive white Toyota pickup sitting on the back of this and he pulls in he gets out and he's got his camera hanging around his neck and he's got his little film. He's that's the thing that Amy and I have in common too, is that my grandpa was this, you know, photographer. So we're (laughs) sitting on the back of this tailgate and he pulls out the, the nastiest looking cantaloupe you have ever seen is like green and yellow and weird. And he like takes out his pocket knife that was like kind of beat up and he cuts a piece off and he looks at me and he goes, just try it and feeds it to me. And I remember it was just like melted in my mouth. It was the best cantaloupe I've ever had in my life. I I've heard Cody say the same thing. I remember this. And he said, you know where I got that, boys? The Safeway dumpster. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Like, Grandpa, you're a, you're a something, you know? He was just something. And so he did that. He, you know, again, he'll, he'll be a But centerpiece. what's interesting about him is he the simplicity and the complexity that I don't even know if that's the right way to say it, but that he, um, brought to life. Yeah. I mean, his work has been featured in very, very unique places like the the Smithsonian, the white house, but he, and he knows how to hang out with all the top dogs but he also knows how to hang out with like the regular people. And that's a very, that's a gift for a human to have. And the the kids, that was Mm -hmm. the thing. Like he's, he was so amazing with kids. And that's why, like for me, man, I just loved hanging out with my grandpa because he was so good with us. He told the stories. He said the little funny things. You'd, you'd say something and it'd be like, if you, even if it was the stupidest thing and he would look at you and kind of cock his head a little bit and he'd go, if he thought it was profound, he would go, ah, so, or, or, and it's silly, but I would just, that's what, or we'd be driving in his truck and he'd go to stop and he'd look over at, at me with like a silly little face and he'd put his foot on the brake and he'd go screech. And then we would stop like just silly stuff that as a kid, you're like constantly just entertained and, um, so, you know, he was about 55 years old. He was working on the, the, the base in China Lake and he retired off that base and he had these like aspirations to go out and to do great things and to take his gift that he had been given and to actually make something of it. And he'd already done cool things at that point in his career. He kind of climbed certain little aspects of the ladder and kind of plateaued, but he, he, they were not wealthy people by any means, like not at all. Like they did not have a lot of money. You wouldn't know and, that looking at them, though. No, because he was kind of like, he kind of presented that Rico, Rico Suave. Suave. Yeah. yeah. And your grandma, she had beautiful diamond rings and poofy blonde hair. Curled. You said that like diamond rings or something that you might want. Amy diamond still wears ring. a $200 ring that I bought her. Like My wedding ring's $200. Mm-hmm. $200. Anyways. So, yeah, Gramp retires at 55 and... Uh, Heads up to Montana. Montana. That 
you know, and he was chasing his dreams. They had taken a trip, just kind of cruised around. It's about 1987. I'll never forget where I was standing when he said, this was just right after the divorce conversation. He said to my mom and I right out in front of Kern Valley High School where I graduated and my kids are graduating. He said, uh, we're moving to Montana. And I remember thinking, what? Like life is crumbling. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, grandpa can't move. Like, what is that? And sure enough, 21 trips to Montana later, he packed everything up there, bought property, started painting. Didn't like knock it out of the park in the first few years, but eventually, man, he he knocked it out of the park and become, you know, became known as uh, one of the top Western artists in America for, for decades. And he was hired by a lot of... Yeah. Um, Buddies with like when, owner yeah. of the St. Louis Rams at the time, Walmart. Um Guys would commission him to paint. Mm -hmm. He always had art studios that were just off the house where he could get away from grandma a little bit. She'd always yell, hey, hon, <laughs> hon. And he'd be like out of earshot, <laughs> up hanging out with the buffalo and Admiral the horse. <laughs> and he'd just paint his little heart out and then he'd come back down. But uh, yeah, look up his stuff because at the time, um, man, he, he, one of the, the great lines that my uncle Todd uh captured from grandpa he did a 60 minute video of his life just kind of interviewed him before he passed away he said i i didn't you know i think todd uncle todd asked him hey what's the secret to life and he said uh, well i didn't i didn't end up it's not a pot of gold but it's basically just to be kind of happy at what you're doing i think that's it and uh mm -hmm. and grandpa he i mean at times he could paint for a month and that painting would have been worth a hundred grand or more and he didn't die a wealthy man like he gave stuff away mm -hmm. and it was pretty incredible like i i love that he uh, used his gift to um he would donate his art to different charity organizations and then they would auction it off for a hundred thousand or more yeah and that all that money would go yeah to help whatever rebuild the old school or whatever it was yeah he's a neat guy very much so anyway so here's what i'm thinking uh, Eric and Amy, we, I have no idea how long we've been talking, but I guarantee it's in the hour zone. It's and about an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think if we kind of, you know, bring some final thoughts to this and, um, if we throw a little capstone on it and, and this is just a thought, maybe we come back in the next episode and we kind of talk about the convergence of our story and kind of mm -hmm. shed a little bit of light on that. Um, you guys have any thoughts? Do you think there's anything that we need to include in this one, Eric, that we might've left out? Um, I, I think that you're good. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It, the purpose, again, behind us telling you some of these stories is it's really important that you understand who we are, where we come from. Mm -hmm. um, one, we, we want you to kind of at least begin to develop a little relationship of trust with us as communicators. And also to know that the journey that we've been on, it's got many facets that make up who Neil and Amy are. And as we you know, continue to uh, journey through these conversations, our greatest passion in life is to help people. <laughs> Somebody said to me this morning, hey, those that want to help people oftentimes get shafted the hardest. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's part of our story too, not war or poor me, none of that. But like we genuinely want to help people find their way and make their life count. Um, so that they can live a life that's enjoyable mm -hmm. and not be miserable. Life is too short to be miserable. So uh, I think we should add something to that. I think it should be life is too short to be fake and live miserable. Ooh. Because how many people do we know that like you would not think they're miserable by looking at them on the outside? True. But then when you sit down and you have a glass of wine, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize what was hiding behind yeah, that smile. Interesting. Totally. It's good. Authenticity. I mean, that, that is mm -hmm. one thing that, I mean, again, you got to be careful how transparent you are uh, publicly, but there's, uh, you got to have safe people that you can be truly authentic and transparent with. And um, for us, helping people find their way, make their life count. That's, that's the aim. So um, we are very glad that you're listening. We would love Thank it. Thank you for taking the time to mm -hmm. get to know us. Yes. 
More to come. We would love it if you would share or get the word out about this podcast. Do that in any platform that you possibly can. Um, we would totally need the help. You are partnering with us to help get the word out so that we can help more people um, find their call and make life count. Also, by going to neilandamy.com, you can get a copy of uh, or pre-order, pre-sell copy of the Wayfinder book and should just be a few, we don't know, a few weeks or so. We've got, we're kind of in the editing side of that right now, but the story's coming along well. We've got about 25 people proofreading, giving some feedback on it. So stoked about that. We would love it if you picked up a copy of that. And I think that's Eric, all. Eric, where can, if a listener doesn't have like access to iTunes, what other network or channels or whatever you would call those, can this be listened to? Well, you can go to, it'll be on Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be on Google um, Play. Podcast, Google Play slash Google Podcast. Um, Spotify. Spotify, eventually I'm working on that. Mm-hmm. Or uh, it's a, there's a little, a few hoops we have to jump through for Spotify. Okay. Cool. Um, I think it's going to be on Stitcher. Okay. And... So there's multiple ways, even if somebody doesn't have an iPhone, they can get to the content. Right. And you can always download a Podcatcher app on your whatever smartphone you have and then just subscribe to the RSS feed that will be available at neilandamy.com. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So I think we're going to sign off. We'll sign off like my nanny used to sign off. Bye-bye for now. All right. See you next episode.